Hello, my name is Diana Larson and I'm the Assistant Director of Collections Management, Exhibition Design and Curatorial Affairs here at the McMullen Museum. Welcome to the virtual McMullen Museum and to our Into the Collection uh, series, our Into the Collection series, which usually takes place live in the museum. This is our fourth virtual presentation and we are happy to have you join us. Uh, may I ask just a little housekeeping that everybody stays muted on the, uh, on the screen. And if you have any questions, you're welcome to share those in the chat. Um, we will hold an in-person session tomorrow from two to 4 p.m. to view some of the works you will see tonight. So feel free to join us tomorrow. Um, today, we are focusing on the museum's holdings of the oeuvre of Cuban sculptor, draftsman, and printmaker, Roberto Estopinian. I have to find the forward, how do I move the slides? Um, hey, Peyton, do you know how I move the slide along? Um, I think you should just be able to click on the screen. Um, so if you go to the tab that you have your presentation up and click on there's the, no tab oh. okay if you just um click just, anywhere on the screen okay there, there we go. go all right okay okay uh so today we are focusing on the museum's holdings of the oeuvre of cuban sculptor draftsman and printmaker roberto estopinian the mcmullen museum was bequeathed 67 of the artist's works by his widow carmina banguria in 2015 and 2016, respectively. Today, we will feature a selection of these in different media and dating from the 1960s through the 2000s. I will begin followed by three of the musician, museum's 2021 student ambassadors who work at the museum during the semester in various capacities. We are fortunate to have Chris Rizzo, Abigail Haile Selassie, and Peyton Wilson from the Collections Committee to speak with you about the Estupinian works they have each selected. First, a little background for today's presentations. Roberto Estupinian was born in Havana, Cuba in 1921. He was part of the country's second generation of vanguardia or avant-garde artists who, strengthening and invigorating the vision of a first generation of Vanguardia artists, endeavored to create a national artistic identity and to achieve international recognition. As a child, Estupinian took drawing lessons at the Centro Asuriano and later attended the San Alejandro Al A Academy. There he studied with sculptor, uh, isn't it? Juan Jose Sicre and became his protege and studio assistant, working with the sculptor on his famous memorial to literary figure and philosopher Jose Marti, shown here. Interestingly enough, Sicre had studied with French sculptor Antoine Baudel, who is also represented in the McMullen Museum's collection. Esther Pignan was introduced to printmaking at the Academy, although he did not respect the instructor. Cuba's, Cuba's only graphic artist at the time, Louis, Luis Martinez Pedro, inspired him to continue drawing and making prints. Following his years at the San Alejandro Academy, Esther Pignan traveled to archeological sites in Mexico in 1948, and then to Europe in 1949, where he discovered the ancient sites and Renaissance and Baroque architecture in Italy, as well as the work of contemporary sculptors, Henry Moore and Marino Marini, who were to influence him. To quote as to Pignan, alluding to this influence, quote, in the post-war, it was significant for me to encounter the work of Henry Moore and Marino Marini. In Moore, it was an abst abstraction anchored in the human figure. And in Marini, it was an expressive humanism, end quote. In Paris, Esther Pignan saw Picasso's Ballard suite of 100 etchings with their technical virtuosity and innovative use of the human form, 
which contributed to his developing ideas about printmaking. In a later interview, Esto Pinon expressed, quote, I am one of those artists who has been pretty fortunate in that I was able to travel before the revolution and the at the end of the 40s and the beginning of the 50s. I saw many things, so much so that I ended up forgetting them. I just wanted to see everything. Then I had the opportunity to return to Europe several times. In the 1950s, Esto Pinon met his future wife, performance artist Carmina Benguria, and participated in an international competition at the Tate Gallery in London for a monument to the unknown political prisoner, a subject he would return to later in life, as we will be seeing in Peyton's presentation. After receiving honorable mention, his entry remained in the gallery's collection. He returned to Cuba in 1954 to take the position of professor of drawing at the Escuela de Ceiba del Agua in Havana and began experimenting with the print medium. After working as a diplomat for the Castro regime, Esto Pinon became increasingly disillusioned with that government's dictatorial policies and finally left Cuba in 1961 to go into exile in the United States. In New York City, where he lived from the 1960s until 2002, he concentrated on making prints. I'm just gonna to go to the first slide, although I won't talk about it for a few minutes. Um, although Esther Pignan was first and foremost a sculptor, he was an accomplished draftsman and printmaker. Throughout his life, he favored three main methods of printmaking, and I'll just sketch those out. Etching, where lines are incised into an acid resistant material like wax over the metal plate. The acid then bites into the plate where the lines are. Aquatint, where powdered rosin is added to the acid resistant medium. So the acid bites through some areas creating a tonal effect. And dry point, where a sharp tool is used to draw lines directly into a metal plate and the depressed areas hold the ink the raised edges left by the tool create a more fuzzy line. Estu Pinyan also created some monotypes where the image is drawn directly onto a smooth non-absorbent surface and transferred directly onto paper, creating a unique image. When asked if etching is an extension of drawing or an independent medium, the artist answered, with me, it is always a chain. One thing has to do with another. It is always an indefinite process to try to capture it in a sculpture. I know beforehand that there are certain elements that in a sculpture find a three-dimensional solution. Unless done in relief, it would be a very complicated situation. Etching for me is an extension of drawing, but it is not something that I could exclusively dedicate myself to." End quote. The Macmillan Museum's gift of 67 works by Esto Pignan, mostly drawings in a variety of media and prints, as well as two sculptures, date from all the decades of his exile years. I am presenting a number of these depicting human torsos, a form that fascinated him for many decades from the 1960s until the 2010s, as I will show. The Macmillan Museum's Esther Pignan collection starts with the 1960s. He begins looking at the human form in the two works shown here. The drawing on the left is an abstraction of a torso and the one on the right, possibly a political prisoner bound up in a shroud with spikes reminiscent of barbed wire, which he returns to later, later on. In an interview, Esther Pignan stated, I must say, no matter how abstract my works could become, it will always be based on the human figure. In the 1970s, Esther Pignan visit, visited the Caribbean and his contact with nature inspired a new, more organic approach to the female figure. Seen here in the graceful drawing on the left, he also experimented with a three color etching technique, actually aquatint etching technique, creating works which, according to William Patterson, Patterson University scholar Alejandro Anreos, quote, evoke a fossil-like quality through their schematic outline and texture, an example of which is on the right. 
And Reyes also writes from the 1980s on, Estupinian focused obsessively on the theme of the female torso as an icon of eternal beauty or as metaphors for the repression of the feminine, unquote. In the McMullen's works from the 1980s shown here, Estupinian treats the torso as his primary subject. The etching on the left presents a double torso of two seated figures, their knees projecting into space and the large pencil drawing of the torso on the right recreates the form and texture of bone. The works from the mid 1990s here show different approaches to the female torso. The dry point aquatint print on the left is abstracted into an almost geometric form that possibly explores maternity, the circle evoking the baby, or the oval actually. Um, the red chalk drawing on the right of a seated figure includes the head, unlike most of the other torsos that we have seen. The twist of the upper body and the use of color give a dy dynamic effect to the composition. Estupinian created eight prints between 1993 and 94, as well as many drawings and some sculptures featuring French sculptor Camille Claudel, who was assistant and lover of Auguste Rodin. The affair was deemed scandalous and after Rodin left her, she became an outcast, eventually dying in a mental hospital forgotten and abandoned by society, friends and family. Estupignan was fascinated with Claudel as a symbol of an art of, quote, art, an artist at war with society a woman seeking freedom to love and to create, to quote Andreas again. By juxtaposing her enigmatic face with two torsos and his dramatic use of light and dark areas, he creates something mysterious and disturbing. By the 2000s, Estupignan was experimenting with other media. And here in his 2005 collage, using wood veneer and metallic papers to give dimensionality. He creates two abstracted torsos interacting harmoniously together like jigsaw pieces. In the two drawings from 2003 and 2004, the abstracted torsos become landscapes of form using color and shading to articulate space. The horizontal image, which seems to recede in space, is unusual in Estopinion's oeuvre, which features mostly vertical compositions. And my final slide of the McMullen's torsos juxtaposes a drawing with the magnificent bronze maternity currently on display on the museum's third floor. The drawing evokes, evokes a smooth surface like metal and incorporates drapery at the side and behind to offset the figure. The bronze similarly uses a different textured surface at the side and behind, which includes the baby on the left to contrast with the smoothness of the torso. To me in these works, the sculptor has resolved his explorations into something timeless and universal. In a 1995 interview, the sculptor stated, quote, the latest thing that has interested me is a manifestation of the feminine torso. I have been speculating over it, taking elements from one sculpture and another, making a summation to make torsos. Sometimes from one side, you can see a reminiscent, reminiscence that is completely classical, or you can be reminded from one angle, from another angle of an African sculpture. Basically, they are different elements with which I have worked to express something. My torsos are extremely personal. They could possibly be an aid to future generations in the understanding of the beauty and the endurance of the human form. To finish, I'm showing a late photograph of Estupignan in his studio in 2013 with two versions of his bronze maternity. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Peyton, for bringing up the slides. 
Um, good evening, everyone. I'm Chris Rizzo, uh, one of the student ambassadors on the McMullen staff and a senior here at Boston College. Um, this evening, I am presenting on one of my favorite works by our, our friend uh, Roberto Estopignan, uh, Untitled Torso with a Dante Quote. Um, and so I, I will build off of what Diana has said and, and perhaps bring some new dimensions uh, into understanding this work. Um, what first may appear uh, to the untrained eye as a, a confused mass of chalk lines and scribbles, uh, with some careful attention, for us morphs into a torso, perhaps a body in motion. Uh, some muscles tense and well-defined, as we can see with the, the, the curve of the lower body, with the separation of the, the uh, figure's thigh muscles. Um, and we can see this body standing in a, a, a classic Renaissance contrapposto pose. Uh, note the lean of the lower half of the body to one side. The definition of the thigh, uh, the shape of the thigh on the left leg uh, of our subject as they pick up their leg to step forward. The body uh, becomes blurred, uh, becomes uh, uh, lost in the, the frenzied chalk strokes that are meant to define the upper torso of the figure. Uh, this imitates the, the drapery, right, and, and those, uh, those uh, uh, almost scratch marks, right, in the, in the bronze torso and in the drawing that uh, D Diana showed a couple slides ago. Um, and we can also see the, the, the squiggles, uh, of course, <laughs> not a very technical term, uh, but that, that fall off of the left side of the figure there, uh, those thin marks. Um, we can call them the unshaped marks of Estopignon that trail off the left side of the figure into blank space. Estopignon here is using um, a, a material to create on paper called sanguine chalk. Sanguine chalk was known famously as a, as a sketching material used by the great masters like Rembrandt, Leonardo, and perhaps most famously by Michelangelo. Uh, I have particularly fond memories of attending an exhibit at the Philadelphia Museum of Art several years ago that focused just on the drawings of Michelangelo uh, and how many of them were done in this sanguine chalk. Artists preferred and still use this material to lay out their compositions, right? So this is Estopignan as draftsman, um, particularly for portraits and figural works because sanguine chalk, as you can see here with its dark red earthy color, is particularly good at depicting human flesh and gives the artist the chance to create shadow and contrast as we see in the middle of the figure and where the figure's head might be uh, without submerging the work in a pool of darkness and blackness. It is interesting to note that Estopignan uses sanguine chalk here as a finishing material. There's nothing else on the paper besides it. Sometimes if artists want to preserve their work made in sanguine chalk or in another more ephemeral material like charcoal and pencil, to prevent it from smudging, they would apply a fixative layer such as wax or another sealant. Estopignan does not do that here. Uh, he leaves his untitled drawing open to the elements and human intervention. Now, one of the most fascinating elements of this piece is the quote from Dante's Inferno in the bottom of the work on paper. Uh, you can see it right here down the corner, maybe very faintly. Uh, Peyton, if you go to the next slide, we can get a detailed view of it. Here we go. So the inscription reads, No hay mayor dolor que acordarse del tiempo feliz en la miseria Francisca de Retiari. Uh, this quote is taken from uh, La Divina Comedia, Dante, uh, the, and then the rest of it reads, La Divina Comedia, Dante. So this statement, uh, 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 taken from the Divine Comedy, translates to, roughly, there is no greater sorrow than thinking back upon a happy time in misery. Uh, and, you know, we can say that uh, Francisca de Retiari is, uh, is, was Dante's teacher and educator in his youth. And so, so we can translate that about to, and this your teacher knows, right? So this quote is said uh, to Dante by his guide through the underworld, Virgil, author of the classic Latin text, the Aeneid. Francisca de Retiari, as I mentioned, uh, was one of Dante's uh, uh, tutors, one of his educators in the days of his youth in Florence. And Dante counted him for much of his life until Retiari's death as a friend and a mentor. The work uh, uh, thus dwells, you know, if once we add this text to the image that we've seen, this abstracted torso that 
you know, is well-defined at times and is lost in other ways. It dwells upon the pain of having left the good times behind. The passage uh, comes f- directly from the 115th verse of Dante's Divine Comedy, as he has left the dark wood that he, where he begins his story and entered into the underworld, into hell. Dante is at the start of his journey through the different worlds of the afterlife, and he is afraid, as many of us would be. He has left the familiar behind. So too that this strange blended figure left behind has left behind the world of traditional figuration. The viewer is also left in this strange space of trying to find a body in this mass of sanguine chalk marks. We too have left behind what is familiar and clear. We are out of the wood and into the fire. Peyton, if you could go to the next slide. So Esto Pignon was an avid reader ever since he was a child. His education in Cuba, his activism for democracy in the 50s and 60s before his exile, and his deep Catholic faith all compelled him to explore the intersection of secularism and religiosity, humanism, and the greatest works of literature, both contemporary and ancient. Estopinian must have been profoundly affected by the Divine Comedy the first time that he read it, which is essentially the world according to Dante. Estopignan, creating this work in 2003 in his later life, surely also identified across the centuries with the great art author and cultural critic that Dante Alighieri was. Dante himself was exiled from Florence in 1302 for his own political activities, uh, including banishing several of his own rivals from the city. He wrote his masterpiece, The Divine Comedy, Homeless, a virtual wanderer in Italy seeking protection for his family in town after town. Surely, Roberto Estopignan identified with his fellow author, political activist, and philosopher, since Estopignan himself experienced exile, life abroad, was forced to leave the familiar behind. Estopignan channels this extremely painful experience into the artistic moment that is this piece, this drawing, giving us a place for our eyes and our minds to dwell and remember the good times, and to remember home. That's my piece. (laughs) Hello, thank you for um, Diana and Chris for your presentations. I'm Abby, I am a senior here at Boston College and I'm a part of the collections management committee here at the museum. And um, this piece that I, will be presenting about um, really struck me the first time that I saw it. It's untitled. It comes from the 1960 to 1965 time of Estopinian's life. And I think the to contextualize this piece, um, it came, it originated from around the time of his exile to the United States. Um, and I think that it excellently shows his his conflicted feelings about his positionality as a Cuban in exile at the time. Um, For a little bit of background, he opposed Batista, who was the elected president of Cuba, and he joined the guerrilla movement against him. And in 1959, um, after the revolution and Castro's um, uh, claim to power, um, he joined the diplomatic service in Cuba. But by 1961, after a visit to Maoist China, he rejected communism and he fled to the US in exile. Um, I think that this piece shows that kind of the duality of his feelings. On one hand, he loved his country and he was extremely dedicated to um, his Cuban identity and entrenched in the Cuban political life as a diplomatic servant and as um, a member of the guerrilla movement. But on the other hand, he could not keep himself in that kind of environment. And eventually he stuck to his political beliefs and left um, the country in exile. Um, To expand a bit more on exile, it is one of the themes in his artworks that appears quite frequently. Um, And I think that um, in comparison to Mariano, who is on display here at the museum. Um, Peyton, if you wouldn't mind going to the next slide. Um, here's the piece that I that is on display here at the museum that I thought 
um, contrasted really well with the Estopinian piece. Um, this uh, artwork by Mariano shows no kind of duality or no kind of divis divisiveness in his own feelings towards his Cuban identity. This artwork shows a clear rejection of US imperialism in Cuba. And I think that the contrast between the two artists really shows a lot, um, shows how even though they were both creating art around the same time, as you note, this piece comes from 1965, which is the same time period. Um, they were not by any means um, in agreement of the, in terms of their political identities. Um, if you would, Peyton, if you wouldn't mind going back to the other one. Um, so this piece, the way that uh, Esto Pinyan created this is pen, ink, brush, and wash on paper, um, which seems like a lot of, um, it seems like a rather simple technique if to the untrained um, artist, but I think that the, the vagueness in the lines and the structuring of the figures in the artwork showed um, the uncertainty that Esto Pinyan felt towards his identity as a Cuban. And um, the dark colors and harsh lines are a reflection of his inner turmoil and perhaps his identification with prisoners as he might have felt like one um, while he was in exile in the US. Um, yes, thank you. Thanks so much, Abby. Um, Hi all, if you didn't catch my name earlier, I'm Peyton Wilson and I'm also a senior studying art history at BC. Um, I'm also lucky enough to be in my second year of my co-chair position of our collections management committee, which Abby and Chris are fantastic members of and which is led by Dan and Rachel. Um, because I'm the last presenter, I just wanted to reiterate how thankful we are for all of you taking time out of your busy Mondays to gather and celebrate how lucky we are to have such prolific art like that of Roberto Esto Pinon at the Big Mullen. Um, and just as Abby mentioned, this Into the Collection comes at a perfect time as well with the McMullen's fall semester exhibition entitled Mariano, Variations on a Theme uh, is on view now until the end of the semester in December. Um, Mariano and Esther Pinon are two of the most foremost figures in modern Cuban art. And if you're interested in learning more about the McMullen's permanent collection, our website's a great way to look through um, all of the work that we have, uh, not only on display, but in storage at the, uh, at the McMullen. So you can look at the pieces we've talked today and also get a look at the Mariano exhibition if you're not able to come into town to see it. Um, so now let me get off my soapbox and present to you my focus piece for tonight, which is Esto Pinon's study for a political prisoner. Uh, it was completed in 2011, and I think it's a great piece to talk about as we wrap up our night. Um, it's arguable that in contemporary times, Esto Pinon is probably best known for his stark and somewhat disturbing renderings of political prisoners, which speak to his own lived experiences as a political dissident under both Castro and his predecessor, which we've talked about a little bit tonight. Um, as Esther Pinon became more interested with the abstraction of the human form in the late 60s, it's also important to note the time at which he was creating his art. Um, as a spiritual man, and as Chris mentioned, an avid reader, um, Esther Pinon would have been extremely concerned with the ongoing Cold War, the after effects of the Second World War, and more specifically, the Nazi concentration camps and the absolute violation of humanity happening during World War II. Um, and then also the novel threat of nuclear detonations. So this means that representing the human form was at the forefront of his mind, and it was heavily influenced by the era of social reckoning that he lived in. Um, as I just mentioned, Esto Pinon was an extremely religious man, and that means something to us here at BC, um, because he was specifically Catholic, he was a, a Cuban Catholic, and um, attended a Jesuit church near his home for catechism classes as a young boy. Um, his father died when he was seven, and as he grew up in a geographic area of intense political strife, it's quoted that he often turned to St. Ignatius of Loyola, who founded the Jesuit order, which we also are a part of here at Boston College. Um, he would turn to St. Ignatius of Loyola's spiritual exercises for comfort. They're also known as an examine. 
Um, and besides being a way of discerning one's relationship to God, the Ignatius examine also has a visual component wherein one pictures in their mind how God is working in one's life. This visualization of Estopinian's connection to God deeply informed his sense of visual aesthetics um, and what it meant to be representing the human form at the time he was creating. So before going into political exile in the US where he lived in first Miami and then New York, he found inspiration in the Romanesque sculpture of the 12th century in Western Europe. Um, this period in art history was filled with elongated stone figures that effectively dramatized religious meaning. In an interview, Estopinian described how he wished for his artwork to become deep and clear and balanced. And this study for a political prisoner on your screen is a prime example of this political and religious investigation um, that Estopinian embarked upon in his later years. The sharp and jagged vertical line of the barbed wire in the center of the figure draws the audience's vision to the central figure, which is somewhat unintelligible except for the abstract face and the broad hourglass figure that alludes to the human form. The audience is drastically confronted with a somewhat sedentary figure, which is counterintuitive for a struggling prisoner. Um, and the pressing of the figure into the foreground separates the audience from the figure. The figure's gaze is downcast and Estopinian's decision to forego any extremities like arms or legs places emphasis on the inability of the figure to move. And it also instills in the audience a sense of urgent quiet and reflection. So because of what we know about Estopinian's life, not only as a political dissident or religious believer, one can almost immediately recognize this figure as a visual manifestation of the internal struggles Estopinian engaged in. Even in 2011, when this piece was completed, Estopinian was extremely interested in representing the human form as abstract. And this stripped down figure in this study is only brought alive by a slight human form ahead. And most importantly, and I would argue most central to the piece, the ways in which this amorphous figure is detained. I like to view this piece as tangible evidence of Estopinian's artistic process. Um, because studies are often a great way to explore an artist's psyche and their process. Um, it's also important to note that this drawing was completed only four years prior to Estopinian's death. Um, and it's clear that the same issues plaguing his consciousness in the 60s, which were presented by Diana and um, Chris and Abby, um, they're still vitally important in his last years. So abstract art, if you don't know anything about abstract art, um, advocates for the dismantling of unnecessarily descriptive and overly decorative artwork. Um, and Estopinian did just that in his uh, creations. So rather than representing or imitating the natural world, Estopinian was able to add to collective discourse um, in a political way, even though he was a um, somewhat of a wandering prisoner himself. Um, it's a collective discourse in a way that's timeless and, and equally compelling no matter the context in which it's viewed. Um, and so that's all I have to have, or all I have to say on um, the study for a political prisoner. Um, I'll keep the slides up and if anybody has any questions, um, you can either pop them in the chat or raise your hand and unmute yourself. But thank you again for coming. <laughs>